Yeah, it's one o'clock in Europe and in South Africa, and it's the time to start this webinar. And I would like to express a warm welcome to all of you to this webinar on controlled human infection study challenge studies, lessons for malaria towards COVID-19. My name is Bernd Rosenkranz, Professor Emeritus for Clinical Pharmacology at Stellenbosch University and President of Fundisa African Academy of Medicine's Development in Cape Town, the co-host of this webinar. Other hosts are Pharmacometrics Africa, Colin Pillar's CP Plus Associates, who will be introduced later, and the COVID-19 Clinical Research Coalition. Their aim is to provide education and training in medicines development and regulation, mainly in Africa. The coalition has been established to accelerate clinical research on COVID-19 in resource limited settings. There has been much debate and controversy about clinical studies using the controlled human infection model CHIM as proof of concept for vaccines and for other therapeutics. This is a timely topic as reflected by the fact that altogether about 320 delegates from across the world have registered for this event. I'm very grateful to all our highly qualified expert speakers who have accepted our invitation to discuss the diverse scientific and ethical issues around this topic with you as members of the wider scientific community. Such studies may in future be performed as a part of the global fight against COVID-19. However, as our disclaimer states, we are not aware of any plans to conduct controlled human infection challenge studies with SARS-CoV-2 virus yet. The moderator of this webinar and the facilitator of the discussions will be Craig Rayner. I would like to express a warm welcome also to him and our sincere thanks for stepping into this role at short notice. Craig is president of Sertara's Integrated Drug Development and Strategic Consulting Services. He has a profound background in clinical drug development and in particular, he has own personal practical experience in virus challenge models, influenza and RSV, and their application in clinical development of therapeutics and in translational clinical pharmacology. He is therefore extremely well positioned to provide context to the discussions today. Before we begin to housekeeping comments, this webinar and contributions of the participants of the speakers will be recorded. And please do not hesitate to use the Zoom chat, chat box function for questions, comments, and also to communicate any technical issues. And with this, I would like to hand over now to Craig Rayner, who will introduce our speakers. Great. Look, thanks very much, Bernd, uh, and, and also Colin, for the opportunity to, uh, to moderate today's session. Um, as, as stated, Controlled Human Infection Challenge Studies, Lessons from Malaria Towards COVID. Uh, you know, look, who, who would have thought that from, uh, from last year to now, um, that we'd be sitting here virtually doing webinars, that we'd be, you know, where I am at the moment, as well as one of our, our, our co-presenters here in Melbourne, uh, in Australia, in, in, in lockdown, uh, with, with uh, all of us unable to travel. Uh, we have the devastation of the number of infections that are, um, that are, that, that are plaguing the, the globe and, uh, and, and also the tremendous number of lives lost. Uh, you know, our lives have really been turned upside down by this disease and we still have major challenges, but, you know, there is some poise for optimism and there is some poise for, for hope. Uh, as of mid-July, uh, we had 23 candidate vaccines in early development. We now have an, 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 uh, some of these in, in phase three trials. We've had some progress on the therapeutics front with the uh, emergency use uh, uh, approval and availability of, of, of remdesivir and also dexamethasone. 
However, I think all of us would like to go faster, um, you know, in our, both our evaluation and also uh, getting access to, to, to both vaccines and therapeutics to um, be able to move uh, from, from the COVID situation. Uh, so human challenge models uh, or HCMs or controlled human infection models, you'll hear them described as CHIN as well, uh, which involves the deliberate infection of healthy volunteers are well established in, in clinical development of therapeutics and vaccines, uh, as Byrne highlighted for, for flu, for respiratory syncytial virus, typhoid, cholera, or malaria. Uh, their aim from a vaccine perspective uh, really is um, to provide preliminary estimates of efficacy and safety and to select the most uh, suitable candidates for further development. In addition, such studies have been used to better understand the immune response processes after infection. So quite a lot of value in that, in, in that um, uh, understanding. From a, a therapeutics perspective, uh, they've been used to define PKPD indices to guide further treatment studies. Uh, they've been used to evaluate the potential early, early um, uh, and, and efficiently for combination dosing paradigms. Uh, construct translational pharmacology um, modeling backbones of entire development programs for specific diseases like malaria, all with the aim of accelerating uh, drug development decisions. And of course, uh, they're not without some debate and must be based on thorough ethical and scientific principles and must involve careful uh, community engagement. So today, this webinar will describe these principles. We, we have uh, eminent um, experts in this, uh, in this faculty uh, who can look at some of the risk mitigation steps taken in previous malaria human challenge uh, studies. Uh, we can explore uh, how that might be applied in the context of COVID, uh, uh, vaccine development in particular, and also address some of these ethical and practical concerns. So, uh, in terms of today, look, we're very fortunate to have an incredible faculty of experts, uh, including uh, Marco Cavallari, um, uh, who is the head of office of anti-infectives and vaccines at uh, EMA. We have uh, Zeb uh, Jamrzik from the, the Monash Bioethics Center at Monash uh, University in, in Australia. Melissa Kapalu from Kenya Medical Research Institute in, in Nairobi. Uh, Colin Pillai from CP Associates and Pharmacometrics Africa um, joining us in Basel uh, tonight. Andrew Pollard, uh, a Professor of Pediatric Infection and Immunity, uh, Director of Graduate Studies, Department of Pediatrics at St. Cross College, University of Oxford and the Children's Hospital Oxford. Uh, uh, Hospital Oxford. Uh, Burned, who has um, introduced al already from the Fundusa, uh, Fundusa African Academy of Medicine's development and Getnet Yume, who is the Regional Director for Global One Health uh, Initiatives of the Ohio State University in East Africa. Um, so, you know, quite a, uh, an outstanding faculty uh, who will be able to share their experiences uh, with us today. Um, they will be uh, covering the, the principles of human challenge studies, leveraging the human infection studies in endemic populations, regulatory aspects, practical experiences, as well as some of the ethical co uh, considerations. And finally, there'll be some facilitated discussion where, um, uh, and, and, some, and some concluding remarks. But before we get started, uh, many of you would have realized that there had been a, a, a starting poll, um, uh, which uh, we asked a, a starting question. Uh, and that question was challenge studies are currently conducted for the following diseases. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and what I'd like to do is to just share uh, the results of that. And the, the results um, uh, were um, for malaria, we had about 85% of respondents, um, uh, 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 sorry, 91% of respondents suggesting that, um, that they are conducted, 28% uh, for dengue, 21% for cholera, 29% for flu, and 29% for SARS. And, um, and the next question which was asked was really around, uh, given my current knowledge, do I support the conduct um, of challenge studies in the following diseases? 
And the poll results for that were malaria, yes, 85%, uh, dengue, 27%, cholera, 30%, flu, 45%, and SARS-CoV-2, 45%. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how this might evolve uh, throughout the course of uh, today's um, uh, uh, panel discussion. So um, I look forward to, um, uh, to, to seeing this a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but uh, just finally, before we get started and hear from our, our, our panelists, I wanted to briefly touch on a, a, a few logistical uh, or housekeeping notes. Uh, so firstly, we're very thankful to the presenters for being involved in the facilitated Q&A at the, the end, where they're going to respond to your questions. Uh, so from a logistical perspective, I'll be doing my best to efficiently move through um, with, um, to the Q&A section. Uh, and so I, I won't spend an enormous amount of time um, on biographies of our esteemed panel members. Uh, I will not be able to give their, their, their full uh, bios justice, but we do have links and um, we would encourage you to go and take a look at um, uh, more information re relating to the, the, the panel's biographies um, at, at your leisure. Uh, as far as questions, uh, please add your questions via the chat box at any time throughout the presentation. We will be collating those questions. Uh, if you have a specific presenter in mind who you'd like to direct a question to, please mention the, uh, the panelists by name. They'll be collected and we'll be uh, uh, doing our best to get through these at the, the end of the uh, QA session. Uh, finally, uh, videos uh, for other than the participant, uh, other than the panel members are, are off as well as the audio. Um, and, uh, and I think as Bern mentioned, we will be recording this, um, uh, this, this uh, 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 seminar as well. So look, without further ado, uh, what I'd like to do is to introduce our, our first speaker, and that's uh, Getnet Yimmer, who, who's going to talk about the principles of human challenge studies. Uh, briefly, uh, Getnet is a, a physician scientist and a consultant medical specialist, uh, a director of the One Health uh, Initiative at the Ohio State University in Eastern Africa. His uh, broad consulting uh, uh, capacity um, for WHO TDR leading and coordinating many RCTs across um, a, a number of African uh, countries uh, and has been a, 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 a PI for, for numerous large projects funded uh, through philanthropic, um, uh, not-for-profits, as well as industry um, uh, organisations. So, um, getting it um, uh, over to you, and we look forward to your uh, discussion on the principles of human challenge studies. Thanks very much. Thanks, Craig, and uh, thanks the organisers for giving me this opportunity to share whatever I have in terms of the, the human challenge studies. Getting that humor is my name again, and uh, I will try to be as, as brief as possible and leave some time for our discussion. So uh, today in, in uh, our discussion, the, I mean, before perhaps taking you to the, the main one, something that's closer to the, the human challenge study that I did, I want to share my experience with you. And um, I have been engaged that in a different level, be it as a PI monitor, auditor, or field coordinator in different clinical trials in uh, the seven different African countries, namely South Africa, Zambia, Uganda, Nigeria, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And I will be touching on some of the experience that I had from those in, in deliberating on this topic. But um, I, I also have a disclaimer that I, I never had a first-hand um, kind of uh, experience on the human challenge study and the closest phase one study that um, I was a PI on, which just got published yesterday on drug safety was uh, the, the micro cocktail study that we did. We challenged not with an infection, but with a drug, healthy volunteers with a drug. And uh, I mean, we had to do all the due diligence, the care, monitoring of safety, short term, long term. So I have that experience as well and try to come back and allude to this one as, as we discuss. Um, the, some of the key considerations that I want to deliberate on today, based on the experience that I had in Africa, 
is I want to say a few words about, you know, the, the importance of community culture and uh, also the, the capabilities of different setup in Africa in terms of human and infrastructure, weighing on the risk and benefit, looking into the, the, the readiness and capability of a regulatory body and, and IRBs as well. And we'll, we'll say, I will say a few words about the different components of the informal cons consent in relation to the human challenge studies. So uh, those are the areas that I will be uh, walking you through, but I will try to be as, as brief as possible. As has been said by our, the, the two previous speakers, I mean, challenge studies have, have already been there for the last more than 100 years, then in, in, on different diseases, and we have had wonderful major innovations following human challenge studies, mainly on malaria, typhoid, and cholera. And you will be hearing a lot on, on the one on malaria. Why do we need to do the challenge studies? Obviously, it has already been uh, said earlier, but I really want to emphasize from the African perspective that uh, when we conduct a human challenge study, yes, we don't need lots of hundreds of thousands of individuals to compare two different vaccine candidates and beyond. Yes, because of the, the, the duration of follow-up and also the number of individuals is also cheaper. And if we take a very good example like the, the, the COVID-19 now, I mean, let's assume that we'll be heading into an inter-pandemic period when we want to be having anything and you want to check the, and compare the efficacy and safety of a vaccine and the best way to do it where you, have, you don't have any active, intense community transmission of the disease, is to do it on a human challenge study. So there are lots of benefits, and I selected these five in terms of, I mean, for our discussion that there are a number of different benefits why we want to do the human challenge study. But having said that, obviously, from the ethics perspective, we don't need anyone to tell us that uh, infecting individuals deliberately is obviously, it looks unethical, but I can tell you that there are times, and as has been approved and done in, in different area, there are times and scenarios whereby it could also be ethically acceptable. And what are these times and, and when do we accept that this is ethically, clinically, and scientifically sound to conduct human challenge studies? There are a number of different examples, and, but a very good, the uh, example is in case of, I mean, if we have, for example, if you see malaria, typhoid and cholera, we had already an obvious treatment and management for those days. So in the presence of a definite cure and management, there you justify that is ethically sound to conduct. And there are a number of other reasons why it's really ethically acceptable to conduct, um, I mean, a human challenge study. Uh, having said that, we also need to make sure something that we lack in most African setup is uh, for a disease whereby the, the long-term cycle and, and of course the consequence and we don't have efficient vaccine or drug, we need to be, I mean, we need to put a question mark there and scrutinize the, the, the risk and, and the, the risk and benefit there very well. So, Taking you a little bit to experience globally in Africa, obviously, let alone a human challenge study, conducting phase two, three, sometimes one, clinical trial is, is pretty much uncommon. If you see the, the figures out there, how uh, the percentage of clinical trials conducted compared to that of globally and in Africa, it's only pretty much limited. So, and coming to the human challenge study, almost in existence, only less than uh, pretty much few studies. So that tells us that the preparation from different stakeholders, the IRB, the investigators, the SMB, all the actors, the experience is pretty much limited. And also, of course, aligned with uh, the experience, I tried to check guidelines and policies in some countries, most African countries, let, they do have a guideline, including GCP guidelines on uh, how to conduct different clinical trials, but not a human challenge study. So we still lack guidance globally on, 
on uh, human challenge study, which is pretty much lacking that we really want to build the capability on. The other piece that I also want to bring to your attention is the need for a highly specialized facility to detect, manage, monitor for a longer term if needed of individuals participating in the human challenge study. So we need to make sure that we have those capabilities as, as we embark in doing those one. In addition to that, our national standard of care in terms of treatment, including managing participants in a critical setting needs to be, I mean, optimal enough for us to, to, to go there. Coming to, I, I really want to zoom in a little bit on um, uh, the IRB and for the last eight years I have been serving in different IRBs including the Ethiopia and I'm now a chair of the AHRI Alert Ethics Committee in Ethiopia and a member at the National Ethics Committee in Ethiopia. And I can tell you that we are not prepared. We don't have the experience, we don't have the training to review any study that involves human challenge study. And uh, let alone the human infection challenge studies, even clinical trials, we have limited experience in terms of um, individuals reviewing those. So I, I really want to reemphasize that we need to build on uh, that capability before we say we approve. And one way of doing that is establishing a separate, highly specialized oversight committee that could advise IRBs in giving guidance that this is, yes, is sound enough in terms of ethics clinically and, and scientifically besides uh, the ethics committee sitting there. So I really want to emphasize that IRBs, regulatory bodies in our setup are not optimal enough and are not experienced uh, uh, to, to give a go ahead for, for this kind of studies. And uh, I also want to, 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 I mean, to point out here that as we always do in clinical trials as well, in all stages, starting from the pre-initiation, initiation, and follow-up and the closeout, we have to make sure that we are compliant with all the high-level standard of care, both ethically and scientifically, if we want to pursue conducting this kind of study. And uh, obviously, we have to make sure when we review as an IRB member that not only for study participants, but also for investigator team members, things are really protective equipments and everything is suitable and they are, because we are dealing with something that we don't know, we have to make sure that we have all the PPE and other uh, necessary, I mean, uh, things that um, we, we may need to have to ensure that uh, we are, we are uh, very well covered. The other piece beyond the IRB is the consent. You all can anticipate that consent by itself from the information comprehension and the agreement piece is a complex and, and it has got lots of controversy and challenges. And when we bring it to the human challenge study, this is even much, much more complex. Whereby at times in this type of study, we may need to bring in some complex words, thereby the literacy level we expect from participants has to be higher and we'll be hearing examples uh, later on. And obviously, in uh, our setup, in African setup, we may need to engage at all level when we advertise, when we enroll, we have to make sure that we involve community members, at times even the uh, community advisory board and, and the community chief, chiefs need to be involved. We need to consult with the elderly. We have to bring in the social scientists who would help us in the language of the consent. And we have to make sure that we really understand the culture and the belief of that community as we embark on doing this kind of study. And we have to make sure that the consent and the, the entire process is reviewed throughout the study. And as we always say, participants have the right to withdraw at any point in time as we conduct the study. And it also works here in the human challenge study. So that's an area that I really want to stress. Obviously, as I, I mean, come to the finish line, I always want us, attendees of, of, of this forum, to always weigh in, not in a normal way, but 
as much as possible in a quantitative way, the risk and benefit analysis, be it psychological, economical, social, and physical risk and benefits, it has to be weighed in in a quantitative manner we as, as we embark on approving and conducting this kind of study. And mind you, as I said earlier, since we have, I mean, benefits and risks that we know and that we anticipate has a potential, and then later on, when the true risk and benefit comes, we have to weigh in that too. And uh, mind you, later on it will be discussed when it comes to, I mean, thinking of this in, in uh, the era of COVID, that benefits and risks to the community and to the individual has to be weighed on properly before we, we give a green light. Again, earlier on, uh, the, I mean, the facilitator told us that uh, we may do a number of things as long as we have the number of individuals in the human challenge study, as we try to minimize the number of participants, we may take optimal amount of different type of sample, be it from saliva, blood, so that we don't recruit, I mean, large number of individuals. At the same time, we only don't study safety efficacy PK. We also study details of the immunology and other studies. So, it's always good to think about how can I optimally obtain additional sample in an already existing individuals in a, in a manner that's allowed ethically and, and scientifically as well. So we have to consider all that too. And obviously we need to have pretty much close monitoring and uh, as, as, as we work on uh, yeah, uh, this kind of study. And we also need to think about the long term consequence and complications. So we shouldn't only stop now and we have to think about the long-term complications. And mind you, as the way we do it in phase one study, our evaluation, be it as an ethics committee or as a member of the investigator team, needs to start on who has registered to be, to be enrolled in this kind of study. Even from the registration, we can tell that this study may be, you know, affecting some minors. If we have individuals who are poor, who have limited access to different kind of stuff, lined up to be enrolled in this study, we have to put a question mark. Are we really getting the right advertisement out? So, and, and we also need to think about the insurance and comp compensation package. That's pretty much, I mean, an essential component of it. Finally, I want to end by uh, I mean, telling you all that it's not only the science. If we don't do it right, it's about losing trust. And losing trust is not only by the public. It's also by the different groups. Now we, are already, we have already started seeing public trust with regulatory bodies in different countries, you know, with all the emergency use authorizations and the like. So in case of the, I mean, the, the human challenge study, we have to make sure that we maintain the utmost public trust and not only by the public, but also by expert groups. And one way of ensuring that is engaging all these stakeholders as we plan from the inception and answering their question as, as it comes. And in a very transparent manner, engaging them and also making sure that we are doing social justice at, at all steps is something that's highly recommended. So for colleagues out there, I want to summarize that if we want to involve, get engaged in a, I mean, undertake a human uh, infection challenge studies, we have to make sure that we have all the regulatory framework policies and guidelines in place. At the same time, when we are allowed to do it, we have to make sure that we are following the highest ethical, scientific and clinical requirements as we conduct these studies. And obviously like any other study, we need to ask about, do I have the resource? Do I have the team? And do I have the go ahead from all those individuals? And I will stop there. Those are some of the reference that I have. Thanks for the opportunity again, and I'm happy to reply for any question, over. Thank you very much, Getnit. That was, a, that was an outstanding um, 
uh, overview of, of the principles of human challenge models. So thank you very much. So we'll move now on to our next speaker, and that's uh, Melissa Kapulu, uh, who will be talking uh, about leveraging human infection studies in endemic populations. Uh, Melissa is a, a trained immunologist and vaccinologist based uh, at the, the Kemri Wellcome Trust Research Program in, in Kenya and the Centre for Tropical Medicine and Global Health University of Oxford uh, in, in the UK. Her uh, current portfolio of work includes uh, and involves Shigella and also malaria and the application of human infection models. Uh, a, 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 again, a, a a, a very extensive biography, which I'd encourage you to, to look at uh, offline. Um, but uh, Melissa is the, the principal investigator for uh, Shigella human infection studies and a co-PI on some malaria human infection studies. So we're looking forward very much, um, Melissa, for um, learning about uh, getting some insights from you on leveraging human infection studies in endemic populations. Might still be on mute there, Melissa. Yes, thank you there very much, Craig. Um, and um, thank you very much, the organizers, <clears throat> for inviting me um, to this session. I think uh, GetNet has given a very good introduction about um, challenge studies. And what I'm going to do here is give an example of um, how we've used um, challenge studies for malaria to sort of understand um, immunity as well as how we're um, establishing the model um, uh, as a platform to answer key questions. Um, so the title of my talk is Leveraging Human Infection Studies in Endemic Populations, uh, generally because these have been mainly uh, done in naive populations and primarily to uh, investigate vaccine efficacy of candidate uh, antigens. So when we move to um, the African um, context, um, over the last, uh, I would say, five to 10 years, we've seen quite a number of um, human infection studies carried out on the continent. And these have been mainly on malaria because we know that malaria is such a huge challenge in, uh, on this continent. And the fact that we also have the availability of um, challenge agents that is GMP produced and is um, easily uh, accessible. So we've had um, challenge studies now done in over um, five uh, countries, both spanning east and west coast of Africa. And this has involved um, looking at either vaccine efficacy or looking at infectivity um, or looking at um, potential genetic susceptibility to malaria. So overall, they've, they've been to date about over 500 individuals who've, been, who've taken part on the continent in malaria human infection studies. So, so what is the role? So like I mentioned before that um, for malaria, a lot of the um, human infection studies have been carried out to look at vaccine development. And clearly, um, um, CHMI has played a huge role in vaccine uh, acceleration for malaria. Uh, the current RTSS uh, vaccine in phase, in phase four implementation studies had been uh, looked at um, in a CHMI model in naive individuals, and other candidates are uh, also looked at uh, using this model. So you can actually, uh, at, the, at, at the moment, all three stages of the life cycle of the parasite, there is a particular model that one can apply um, for human infection for malaria. So you can look at it uh, at the infection stage, which is where you have the one uh, major antigen, the ITSS I mentioned. Also at the blood stage, which is the anti-disease stage. Uh, and also at the transmission stage, we know there's development of transmission uh, models for human infection studies. Again, the primary goal for this is looking for um, proof of principle, trying to down select candidates um, for vaccine uh, acceleration. Now, in our context, uh, why are we particularly looking at um, human infection studies in endemic populations? Um, because we want to better understand uh, naturally acquired immunity. 
as well as accelerate vaccine development, but also um, test um, efficacy of vaccines and potentially other um, anti-malarial drugs. And when I mean, when I talk about accelerate vaccine development, um, the, 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 this model actually offers us an opportunity to more or less go back to antigen discovery so that we can begin to look at um, potential antigens that can be um, developed as second or third generation vaccines uh, in the context of naturally acquired immunity. So I've, I've chosen a case study from um, the work that we've carried out here in Kenya. And this is basically a controlled human infection malaria in semi-immune Kenyan adults. And all our challenge studies are in healthy adult population. And the main um, idea behind this study was to just understand what the role of pre-existing immunity was in relation to parasite growth. And secondary to that, we also wanted to uh, look at uh, identifying key parasite targets that can be prioritized, as I mentioned, as either second or third generation um, anti-malarial vaccine. So in our setting, um, so Gebna had, uh, has, has gave a, a good background on what one needs to have in order to sort of set up these studies. So we have gone through quite a bit of extensive community engagement and stakeholder engagement for us to establish these studies in our setting. Um, we have um, all, all our studies um, in, go through uh, ethical as well as regulatory approvals for us before we can even begin. So what we do is that we screen our volunteers, um, ensure that they're healthy. And once we've ensured that they're healthy, we can then um, infect them with um, sporozoids. Now in our setting, what we do is we directly infect um, sporozoids um, rather, than looking, rather than using the mosquito um, to um, infect uh, participants. Uh, naturally, as we know, malaria will incubate in the liver for a couple of days. And then from about day seven in our setting, we, we begin to look for blood um, stage uh, infection or parasites. Now, key things to consider here are, we use a really sensitive method. Instead of using microscopy, we use uh, PCR, which is far much more sensitive to detect parasites. So we're, we're, we're really looking for um, even the uh, smallest quantities of parasites and we're able to pick these up from these volunteers. Another thing is that we're ensuring safety. So safety is a key criteria um, in what we do. Uh, another thing to consider when um, looking, for, looking at challenge studies is the rescue treatment. So we uh, ensure that all volunteers, regardless of their uh, outcome, uh, are treated at endpoint. So we follow them up up to 21 days, and then they receive endpoint treatment, and this is directly observed uh, therapy. And we use the national uh, recommended antimalarial um, chemotherapy, which is atomitalumefine. So this is just a timeline of the study events. Um, so like I said, we, we, we screen, we make sure they are healthy volunteers. On the day of challenge, we uh, give them the, um, the inoculum, and then we carefully monitor them after that. So for the first seven days, we're carefully monitoring twice daily to, in, to look for uh, blood stage parasites. Like I said, we're using a really sensitive method for detection. And then uh, from day 15, we are looking uh, once um, daily um, to look for uh, these parasites. So just some uh, key um, um, outcomes that we've had. So we, we ch we've challenged 161 uh, volunteers, out of which 142 we've been able to analyze and include in the final analysis. And we have two key broad outcomes. So we've, we've had majority of these volunteers who have uh, more or less been resistant. And when I say resistant, what I mean here is that these are volunteers who either are highly immune, have no parasite growth at all, or they grow parasites, but uh, at very low levels. And then the second group of volunteers are individuals who come down with malaria. And another key thing here with malaria is because we know what signs and symptoms to look out for. We know the um, 
clinical outcome of the disease. So it's, um, it's easy for us to uh, pick up um, these uh, particular individuals before they um, even develop a really severe uh, disease. So we've had no serious uh, adverse events and we've had nobody developing any uh, severe uh, malaria outcome. So just uh, an example of uh, parasite in relation to our key outcome, uh, looking at parasite growth. So this is what usually typically happens. You give somebody an infection and then um, they, and you then treat them at a particular time when they've reached the set threshold for treatment. Uh, we've had that group in our, in our population who we call susceptible. We've had people who slowly grow parasites and then people who grow parasites up to maybe day 10 and then clear and you don't detect those parasites at all afterwards. And then we have our highly immune phenotype um, who don't show any parasitemia at all. So one thing that we're learning from this is that um, history of malaria exposure as well as antibody responses are really key and associated with um, outcome from uh, infection. So some key considerations uh, in summary is that we are seeing from our studies is that parasite growth is affected uh, by previous exposure to malaria. And again, this is something that one would not typically see in a, any, in a naive population. So from this, we're really getting some key insights and understanding um, on uh, immunity to malaria and how this and how previous exposure influences this. And one thing uh, for sure is that we know that uh, from this study that um, our outcome is definitely influenced by the fact that our volunteers have had um, uh, past exposure uh, to malaria. So uh, again, this is uh, just to say uh, thank you to our study participants. Um, this study was um, funded by the Wellcome Trust and um, it's not a one person effort, this is a team effort um, from um, various um, uh, individuals. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much, Melissa. Melissa, would you, would you mind um, <clears throat> uh, putting on your video just briefly, I know that we've been having some connection issues, but I'm sure all of the participants would love to see your smiling face as well. So look, I just wanted to thank you very much for, um, uh, for continuing this, uh, this, this storyboard along, um, uh, you know, so, so eloquently. Um, so we've, we've now heard, you know, the principles of um, the human challenge models. We've now transitioned into um, this from a, a, a with uh, the human challenge model in its relationship to malaria uh, and now we're going to to move on from Melissa um, and uh, we'll see Melissa again when we get towards the, the, the question time uh, and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker who is um, uh, I've seen in, in, in action um, a, a, a number of times um, leading WHO working groups in therapeutics and um, uh, it's my, my pleasure to, to, uh, to introduce Marco uh, Cavallari uh, who will be talking about the regulatory aspects of uh, human infection challenge studies. Uh, for um, uh, Marco has um, an extensive regulatory background. He is the, the head of uh, office of, of Biological Threats and Vaccine Strategy. He's the, the chair of the EMA COVID Task Force, uh, responsible for EMA activities for emerging pathogens, vaccines, and also uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, he's um, a pharmacologist, so we don't, um, we don't count that against you, Marco. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and also has a, a, an extensive um, past experience in industry as well. So um, my pleasure to welcome you, Marco, to talk about the regulatory aspects of human uh, infection challenge studies. Thank you so much, Craig, and, uh, and uh, really uh, uh, greetings here from Amsterdam from myself. Uh, indeed, I will tell you a little bit about the regulatory perspective. I don't have slides also because time is limited, but uh, I will just uh, mention a few aspects that are very important. So first of all, uh, uh, where do human challenge study play a role uh, in the context of vaccine development? Uh, for sure, they could have a role in early clinical development, and indeed, they could be relevant uh, in terms of uh, proof of concept studies. They could be important in order to define what are the new markers of relevance 
uh, with respect to the new response that could lead to protection for any specific vaccine. And indeed, they could be instrumental in order to investigate corrects of protection. And also, they could be important in order to uh, support the dose selection for uh, a later uh, stage clinical trials. And uh, also, in some cases, we have seen that uh, human channel studies have been supportive or even pivotal for uh, uh, the approval of a new vaccine. And we have a case that was not uh, a long time ago, which is a cholera uh, vaccine, which was approved uh, um, in the United States first and then after in Europe by the EMA. And indeed, in those circumstances, the pivotal data that supported licensure uh, were based on uh, results from human challenge studies. So this really shows that uh, there are circumstances situations uh, in which uh, uh, human challenge studies could even provide uh, the evidence that would support the approval of a vaccine. So uh, in a way, be quite convincing uh, in terms of defining the benefit risk uh, of uh, the vaccines for any specific pathogen. Of course, this is not true for all the pathogens and there are a number of factors that will have to be considered, particularly from the scientific perspective. But nevertheless, I think uh, it's a good example of the fact that uh, if the conditions are there, uh, these studies could lead into uh, approval of vaccines. And of course, you know, they could have also some other complementary role as uh, um, understanding what could be the level of protection in defined subpopulation that could not be studied in large clinical trials, or maybe in certain cases to understand what is the level of protection uh, uh, when uh, the viruses are changing. And a lot of discussion in this sense is taking place for influenza as an example, uh, where it would be important to have a good understanding on the breadth of coverage in terms of protection for any new vaccine, particularly those that are supposed to have uh, uh, really um, a larger breadth of coverage than the one that are currently in use for uh, uh, seasonal influenza. So, uh, so these are the main areas where uh, uh, human challenge study could have an impact. And as I said, there are important scientific aspects that will end up having a, a particular impact in terms of uh, what is the value of these studies for uh, regulatory appraisal of vaccines. And uh, I will just quote a few of them. Uh, of course, uh, the strain attenuation is an important one. And we know that in many cases, it's pretty much unavoidable to go into strain attenuation in order to uh, decrease uh, any consequence for the participants in the clinical trials if the disease will be uh, or could be too severe and in case there is not the possibility of having uh, a sufficiently adequate uh, rescue therapy. So strain attenuation clearly something that is looked at, but of course the other side of the coin is that when you attenuate a strain, you in a way introduce an artificial factor and uh, that could put you in a very difficult different situation than what happens with exposure to the wild type uh, pathogen. So it's very important uh, to keep in mind that strain attenuation may facilitate the conduction of human channel studies, but at the same time could complicate uh, the interpretation of the data and the relevance for what is at the end of the day, the role of this vaccine, which is protecting from um, wild type uh, infection. Uh, but then there are other aspects to take into account, like the, the route and the dose of the challenge. There is always something a bit artificial in this selection and how much these uh, represent and really fully uh, respect what we may see with, the, with natural infection uh, could pose uh, some question and it might not be always possible really to extrapolate as much as we would like. Also, the generalization from a single strain is not always that possible or not always that easy. And, and that, of course, is, uh, is another aspect to keep in mind when uh, talking about uh, how to set up your human challenge studies and which kind of strain to, to use in order to demonstrate uh, uh, the efficacy and the level of protection of your vaccine. And then, of course, there are other factors that would go from the timing from immunization, which is also very important. And in many cases, uh, approaches have been 
uh, done taking into account uh, a challenge at the time of the peak of the humoral immune response, uh, while in actual fact you might be exposed to the pathogen in real life even much longer, and it might be also important, particularly for certain pathogens, to have some indication of what is the, the level of protection when challenge is occurring really uh, far away from uh, the vaccination. And just to mention also the impact of pre-existing immunity, that is something that could have really a huge impact on the outcome of the trials and, uh, and the level of extrapolation that you can have. So it should be considered at least with certain pathogen as an important factor to be taken into account. Um, of course, you know, when we are talking about the use of human challenge studies for uh, uh, generating pivotal evidence for authorization, uh, the prerequisite is normally that field efficacy trials are not feasible and cannot be conducted. And uh, of course, it's not possible to use uh, immunogenicity or immune course of protection in order to uh, infer the level of protection of the vaccines. But uh, there are circumstances in which all these uh, uh, cases are met. And therefore, uh, uh, in, in such cases, I think regulators now are more and more open to discuss what can be done and to what extent indeed well-conducted and, uh, and uh, sufficiently informative human challenge studies can be in order to lead then uh, to an approval of, of a vaccine. Um, of course, in terms of approval from a regulatory standpoint of the clinical trials, uh, all the necessary information with respect to the protection of the participants in the, in the study and the personnel involved in the clinical trials are important. Uh, this uh, is something that, of course, is shared with the ethics committee uh, decisions, but uh, uh, a regulator also can come up with some suggestion with respect to how to actually conduct the, the, the human challenge studies. And maybe the other last point that for me is worth mentioning is indeed uh, the fact that also the challenge material, so the pathogen that is used for the human challenge studies have to be of sufficient quality in order to ensure that uh, uh, what is given to the participant will not be causing uh, uh, harm, uh, or at least, you know, behind what would be expected from the, the challenge of the specific pathogen itself, and that indeed it would be possible then to have a material that is uh, made in a consistent way, and therefore uh, uh, the results from the challenge studies can be extrapolated in the broad sense for a regulatory conclusion. And, and again, I think uh, uh, we as regulators, we are very much open to discuss with developers the potential setup of the human challenge studies, how they could be used for the sake of coming up with uh, uh, either streamlining the early clinical development or even, as said, in certain circumstances for um, informing really the, 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 the efficacy of the vaccine in case other tools normally used for uh, demonstrating protection are not feasible for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, there are certainly cases like Zika, for example, where we have been advocating for the importance of setting up human challenge studies. But of course, we have to balance this with all the concerns related to the unknown and the potential harm that this uh, challenge material may cause, uh, particularly when rescue therapy is not available. Um, but nevertheless, this is not a reason for stopping the dialogue and, uh, and continue exploring to what extent we could use human challenge studies to speed up the development of new vaccines, particularly for uh, our med medical needs. And I will stop here, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Marco. Um, uh, a, uh, a much appreciated um, uh, delve into the insights around regulatory, and I'm, and I'm sure there'll be um, a, a variety of questions which will come up during the panel discussion as well. So um, again, thank you. Thank you very much. So let's um, switch now to our next speaker. And uh, that's uh, Andrew Pollard, um, uh, is the chief investigator of the uh, Oxford SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So he's, he's particularly well equipped to discuss the practical experience with COVID-19 uh, vaccine development. Uh, again, brief, brief, uh, briefly touching a few highlights on uh, Andrew's extensive um, uh, background. He is uh, Professor of Paediatric Infection and Immunity at uh, the University of Oxford, uh, Honorary Consultant Paediatrician at Oxford Children's Hospital, 
and uh, Vice Master of St Cross College, Oxford. Uh, he has uh, e extensive experience uh, and, and, and research track record with more than uh, 37 PhD students and, and uh, over 500 manuscripts in various topics in paediatrics and infectious diseases. Uh, he's been uh, particularly active in the design, development and clinical evaluation of vaccines, including those uh, for meningococcal disease, enteric fever, and, and leads uh, uh, studies that uh, uh, use human challenge models of, of, of uh, uh, paratyphoid. Uh, he chairs the UK Department of Health and Social Care's uh, Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, uh, is a member of a, a broad array of other um, uh, um, uh, committees, including WHO committees and EMA um, uh, advisory groups. So, uh, so with that, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to, to welcome Andrew and, um, you know, like all of the panellists, I have no idea how you found the time uh, as well. Uh, and we look forward to uh, hearing your insights on uh, the application or practical experience with COVID-19 vaccine development. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, so I, I'm just going to talk a, a little bit about uh, coronavirus vaccines in the next few minutes and um, uh, not focusing on China studies, but uh, obviously very happy to talk about that in the discussion. I, I think um, it's very clear to everyone that uh, there's uh, an enormous um, challenge around the pandemic um, with the burden of disease around the world. But of course, the, this map that WHO has produced, um, which is updated from uh, the end of last week, shows uh, where we're able to detect cases where there is availability of testing, but it really doesn't provide a, a, a real picture of where um, most of the cases um, are occurring at any one time, because it's, it, it's uh, so limited to the amount of testing um, that's available. And one of the really important strategies that has to be for coronavirus vaccines, given this global um, scale of the problem, is that they have to uh, be able um, to provide protection in many different populations. And that's a really important part of um, any strategy um, for vaccine development. Um, as uh, you all well know, the coronavirus is decorated on the surface by spike protein. And it is this spike protein, which is the main vaccine antigen that's been selected in uh, the many development programs that you heard about um, in uh, the introduction. Uh, it binds to the ACE2 receptor on the uh, surface um, of uh, many cells in the human body, but um, um, importantly here in the respiratory tract. And we had the genome available um, of the virus, and therefore we knew the, the sequence of the gene for spike protein back in January. And it's the uh, amazing technolo technological advances over uh, the last decade, which has allowed us so rapidly in, in the emergence of a new virus uh, to, to have a genome sequence that allows uh, the very rapid development of new vaccines uh, against it. And, and of course, we had another head start, which was the previous outbreaks of uh, coronaviruses over the last 20 years, SARS um, 18 years ago, and MERS, which emerged, emerged around about 2012. And uh, these um, two viruses uh, were contained using public health measures, so isolating the individuals um, who had uh, the symptoms of the disease uh, was able to halt transmission and, and prevent further spread. And that was particularly um, critical for SARS with 11% mortality, but even more so with MERS, which um, killed over a third of the individuals um, who were infected. But fortunately, neither of these viruses were terribly transmissible, and that means uh, that uh, it was possible to contain them in this way. Lots of work went on though in vaccine development, particularly after the emergence of MERS. And so we've learned a huge amount about the biology of coronaviruses, which meant that armed with that knowledge and the information of the genome sequence of the SARS coronavirus 2 that emerged from China at the end of last year, um, it was possible to rapidly move forward and develop new vaccines. And today, um, as you heard in the introduction, uh, according to the WHO list, there's 33 vaccines in clinical development from phase one to phase three, uh, seven that are in phase three, and 143 still in preclinical development 
um, some of which are, um, uh, haven't uh, been uh, extensively tested at all, but others that have been in animal studies um, and are advancing towards uh, first uh, human studies. And the vaccine that we work on um, here in Oxford is a viral vector. And uh, this is a technology in which um, a harmless um, common cold virus, in this case, a virus, an adenovirus, which causes uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infections in chimpanzees um, is used. And uh, with this virus, we take the spike protein gene from coronavirus, convert it to DNA and insert it in the uh, uh, gene sequence of the adenovirus. So that after immunization, the adenovirus acts as a shuttle to take the coronavirus spike protein gene into the cell. And then after one round of um, uh, uh, expression of protein, the spike protein is expressed and we're able to mount an immune response against it. But the adenovirus is replication deficient. So after it's expressed the spike protein, it's no longer able to cause any further um, infection and auto-replicate and make new viruses or cause any disease. And uh, by using um, this approach, um, we, it's been um, possible with a number of vaccines um, over the last decade um, to uh, generate immune responses against different pathogens. And, and importantly here, uh, we have examples of two licensed vaccines, uh, one uh, being the uh, Janssen Ebola vaccine, which is uh, based on um, an adenovirus, AD26, um, and also the uh, Merck Ebola vaccine, uh, which is based on vesicular stomatitis virus, another viral vector um, used to uh, provide um, immunity by, again, taking a gene from Ebola virus and uh, inserting that um, into the vector. One of the real challenges that uh, we have in vaccine development in the pandemic is this is the normal program of vaccine development, which um, takes uh, five to 10 years. Uh, where uh, we uh, start with vaccine design and often spend some years in the laboratory thinking about how to make a vaccine and testing it in the lab before moving on to animal studies. And only when we have extensive data from animal studies uh, do we start uh, applying for funding uh, to bridge that um, big transition from the preclinical world and to the clinical world to manufacture vaccine and start phase one trials. And then those trials usually take a year or more um, before uh, further funding is released to move to phase two and then eventually phase three and so on um, until um, a license application is made. And uh, that license application um, usually takes a very prolonged period of time for review, um, often a year or more. And so uh, this whole process from end to end um, is rarely um, less than five years. And in my experience is more often nearer 10 years uh, from concept um, to a licensed product uh, that has been scaled. And here in the pandemic, it's an even bigger challenge because we're not talking about um, scaling a vaccine to be able to provide um, regional vaccination of a birth cohort or even global vaccination of the birth cohort. There is certainly the potential for these vaccines to be used at very large scale and for which there is an enormous challenge in manufacturing and a lack of availability of both the supply chain for manufacturing and also the facilities to do it. And so in, in the um, pandemic situation, a lot of these processes have been brought together um, to try to accelerate development, um, working closely um, with regulators um, to, uh, to ensure that everyone is aligned in doing this. And so I've already mentioned the head start we've had in vaccine design because of the knowledge we already had. And um, animal studies uh, were uh, accelerated um, to allow um, data to be generated very rapidly. Um, and in some cases, uh, as with our vaccine before phase one, uh, but this was not made an absolute requirement for established technologies, um, but uh, some of which the phase one started before the animal studies had completed. And uh, then rapid movement from there um, through the phases of trials um, to get to phase three trials. And uh, with, uh, with our vaccine, we started on the 23rd of April, and uh, I, I in, uh, initially enrolled a cohort of 1,000 individuals um, who um, uh, were vaccinated um, here uh, in the UK and uh, published just over a month ago. 
And with uh, this, we were able to demonstrate uh, that the vaccine induced the uh, expected reactogenicity with some local reactions with sore arms in those who are vaccinated. And uh, a number of individuals in the trial um, uh, with the dose that we use uh, will get um, a, a mild um, flu-like symptoms in the first 24 hours. And this seems to be a feature of uh, the majority of the types of technologies uh, which are currently being deployed um, for coronaviruses is that you, you get some systemic reactions in the first uh, 24 hours after vaccination. And uh, importantly, um, uh, we measure uh, neutralizing antibody. Um, and this is uh, particularly important because in the animal studies, the, the neutralizing antibody does appear to be associated with protection um, from disease. And uh, so induction neutralizing antibodies is an important feature. And, and I think reassuringly, consistently across all of the different technologies that have been developed so far, the human studies have shown induction of neutralizing antibody. And we also measure T cell responses. It's likely that T cells are important in limiting um, infection um, in cells that have already become infected. And uh, so uh, this is a, a second important component um, of the response, although uh, much harder in vaccine development to demonstrate that those are associated with protection um, in efficacy studies. And so with uh, uh, this information from phase one, we uh, moved in May to phase two studies uh, where we have two different uh, dose levels of vaccine. And uh, uh, this is uh, now being uh, uh, put together for publication with uh, data I'm showing immune responses um, in uh, older adults. And we haven't, I mentioned on this slide, healthy children, we haven't started the phase two in children yet. Um, and we moved um, soon after that to phase three studies in younger adults. And as the data emerged on, on safety and immunogenicity in older adults, we've also started phase three in older adults. And we have trial sites now in the UK, South Africa, um, and in Brazil. And uh, we're, uh, we'll be approaching 20,000 people enrolled um, over the next month. So far, we're at around about 10,000 in the UK, uh, almost 2,000 in South Africa, and almost 5,000 um, in uh, Brazil. And these studies are designed to provide um, an efficacy uh, readout um, across those um, different um, countries. Um, in this process, we've also made a partnership with AstraZeneca um, and uh, they um, just last week initiated trials in the United States uh, where they will enroll 30,000 people um, into a large um, phase three trial um, in North America. Um, and uh, with another partnership with the Serum Institute of India, trials have just started in South Asia um, uh, of a, uh, uh, the, the vaccine um, in uh, that population. So I, I think uh, with these uh, vaccines, and as I said, very encouraging that multiple different developers already in phase three, uh, we have the potential that an effective vaccine could prevent future waves. Um, the vaccine could be deployed to control um, disease in high risk groups. And that includes those at risk of disease, such as healthcare workers, and also those at risk of severe disease, such as older adults, and uh, those with comorbidities and, and notably, um, diabetes. And uh, so I, I think uh, uh, quite an exciting time to be involved in vaccine development uh, with this huge progress over a, a very concentrated period of time um, that uh, means that we will certainly learn an enormous amount about um, the potential of the immune response against coronavirus induced by vaccines to provide um, protection and hopefully uh, uh, readouts from that um, in the months ahead. And I'll uh, stop there and just thank um, all of um, uh, those who are involved around the world in this program. Well, th thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, and again, you know, I think the, the whole world sort of um, is, hand, is, is sort of waiting with bated breath and is keeping fingers and toes crossed uh, for, this, for this vaccine program as, as well as many others. So um, thank you very much for taking us on a, on a, on a, a Cook's tour of that. Um,
just to let let everyone know we are running a, a little bit um, behind time so we will end up truncating the questions a little bit um, when we get to that but be be before we get there it's um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, uh, a Monash uh, University and now Oxford um, uh, um, uh, alum, I guess, um, is based here in Melbourne, and that's uh, 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 Zeb uh, Jamrozik, who is going to be talking about the practical and ethical considerations for COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine development. Uh, it, uh, so uh, Zeb has, uh, is, a, is a practicing physician and a bioethicist. Uh, his uh, work on in the infectious disease ethics is, is really uh, focused in the vaccine area, vector-borne disease and drug resistance. And he is the lead author of a, a, a welcome trust funded uh, uh, report on the ethical and regulatory issues relating to human challenge studies in endemic settings. Uh, and he's been a member of the WHO Ethics Working Groups on Human Challenge Studies, uh, among um, uh, many, many other um, uh, aspects with his, his career as well. So Zeb, uh, welcome, and we look forward to um, your comments on the practical and ethical considerations for COVID vaccine development. Uh, you might still be on. There you go. Terrific. Great. Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much for asking me to speak. Um, in the interest of time, I'll uh, move on fairly quickly. Uh, I'll be presenting some personal views and unpublished data. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, I was a member of the WHO Working Group on the Ethics of COVID Challenge Studies. Um, and I've previously had funding from Welcome, WHO and the Brochet Foundation. Um, where we are today, as has been mentioned, is that COVID-19 is globally endemic apart from a few island nations and there's been massive global disruption as a result of the disease. We have a very large number of potential vaccine candidates and uh, several of those are in phase three trials with very large numbers of participants. And it's still an open question about where we'll be in the near future. One possibility is that at least one of the first vaccines might be highly effective and safe, which would be great news. And then the focus would be on manufacturing at scale and distributing that vaccine. But we might be in a situation where the first vaccines are moderately effective. Uh, WHO will accept uh, an efficacy of uh, 30 to 50% potentially. Um, uh, they might be not effective or they might be unsafe. Um, some of the trials might not manage to produce results for various reasons that I'll go into shortly. Uh, and we might be in a situation where we need to test multiple vaccines, perhaps even in head-to-head -head trials. Many people, when we talk about doing uh, challenge studies, as Marco mentioned, uh, ask questions like, why shouldn't we just do field trials, standard trials where we vaccinate uh, half the participants with the experimental vaccine and half with a placebo or alternative and we just let them go about their lives and see if they'll be infected and in places where there's ongoing transmission of COVID-19 that seems like a very intuitive and could be a very potentially successful approach. Um, a few constraints about that however are that it takes time even with significant transmission uh, and if we have to test more than one vaccine it can be very challenging to do so. It requires large numbers of participants, so between 10 and 30,000 in current trials for COVID-19. And because many infections uh, with SARS-CoV-2 are asymptomatic, uh, they need to be very carefully designed studies, uh, perhaps more than some other types of field trials. And there's also some important public health constraints. So we need to have enough people in the trial vaccinated before the peak of the epidemic in order to get a readout on whether the vaccine has efficacy. Uh, and that means that if the society goes into public health lockdown, for example, where the uh, field trial is being conducted, we might not get a useful readout on that vaccine. So just to illustrate this, a colleague of mine uh, modeled uh, this in a preprint uh, where we looked at on the x-axis there, uh, the average reproductive number R for uh, COVID-19 or any other disease for that matter uh, during an outbreak and we modeled the likely duration of field trials. And 
if the society is in lockdown with a very low reproductive number below one, the field trials can't report. So you can see those green, black, and blue lines going up to infinity because the trial would take too long. And so the ideal uh, R, the ideal level of transmission for field trials will be an R of about 1.1 to 1.6. Whereas if we get above that, uh, that's getting to the point where the population might, re might reach a significant degree of herd immunity. And if we start the vaccine trial too late in a population where too many people have been infected, uh, we can run into problems with not getting enough infections to get a readout on the vaccine too. And so this highlights some ways in which public health policy uh, and vaccine research are really intimately connected uh, and make the choice of location for field trials uh, particularly interesting and complex. So challenge studies could be used in a couple of different ways um, for COVID-19 vaccine development. One would be a standard way uh, where we could test one or more uh, vaccine candidates in a challenge study, identify uh, some that are most likely to have higher degrees of efficacy and then conduct standard field trials uh, prior to applying for a licensure. On the other hand, if one of the first vaccines shows some degree of efficacy, perhaps a low degree around 50%, uh, then we're faced with a difficult situation where head-to-head -head field trials would be extremely complicated and challenge studies might be a useful way of comparing a moderately effective uh, first vaccine uh, with other vaccine candidates to decide uh, which vaccines could be licensed next or which should be tested next in larger trials. So there's multiple different ways uh, challenge studies could be used here. And they could also, as Melissa mentioned, tell us a lot about uh, the immunology and the pathogenesis and the um, uh, asymptomatic infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, that's just a quick uh, tour through some of the practical um, aspects, but uh, I was a member of this uh, working group uh, where WHO were looking at the ethical criteria for COVID-19 challenge studies, uh, if any were to proceed, and we came up with these eight criteria. Um, there's been some progress since we published this in May. Uh, it's widely thought that at least under certain conditions, the scientific justification for challenge studies could potentially be strong, uh, especially if some of these first vaccines uh, aren't, uh, don't turn out to be uh, highly effective, for example. Um, however, the risk benefit assessment, as GetNet mentioned, uh, can be complex uh, and might need some modeling to work out what would be the most beneficial and lowest risk ways of conducting these studies. Interestingly, consultation, engagement, and some degree of coordination of potential uh, study sites has already begun. Uh, and although to my knowledge, there's no site that has set up to uh, conduct COVID-19 challenge studies, there's certainly been some consideration about where they could be conducted safely and to high scientific and ethical standards. Uh, it's widely agreed that participant selection, among other things, uh, should be uh, designed such that risks are minimized and acceptable for participants. And the document, WHO document, recommended that there should be an additional layer of independent uh, ethics review by an expert, expert committee, uh, and also that informed consent should be particularly rigorous, although it's worth noting that challenge studies in general have been real leaders in the informed consent uh, space, and there's been a number of innovations in informed consent recently. So that's just a quick tour of the uh, criteria that the working group came up with uh, and the progress that has been made on each of those criteria so far. Uh, and I'd be happy to take questions and uh, thanks to my great collaborators uh, and uh, to the working group for inviting me here today. Great, look, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Zeb, for that. That was um, uh, a, a great way to round out the, um, the, the presentations. So uh, I think what we'll do now is uh, move to uh, some questions. So we have, um, uh, I believe about 12, uh, 12 minutes left. So what we might do is uh, focus um, uh, uh, on a, a few questions. We'll try to keep them um, pretty brief or, or have, have your responses pretty brief if we can. Uh, so I think the First question I have is, is um, I'll, I'll direct to Melissa, if I may. Um, Melissa, there's, there's multiple questions which um, are coming across um, 
uh, about the technical implementation aspects of the, the challenge model. Uh, one, one of those questions is, you know, do, do you have a, a publication that's, that's coming out or that could um, uh, potentially be shared with, with people? Uh, and, you know, have, and, and, and a very specific question from this is, have you had any severe or serious adverse events reported during the course of the malaria human infection studies that you've performed previously? Um, thanks, Greg. So um, to start with the last question, so we've had no serious adverse event reported to date. Um, the normal things we've seen, um, uh, fever, uh, malaise, so the normal things that are associated with uh, clinical signs and symptoms of malaria, we've had no serious adverse events. Um, what, we, what we do in our protocols is that we ensure that we cater for if there is an eventuality of having that um, outcome. So we do ensure that um, if, for instance, we do get sever severity of illness, um, that individuals would be taken care of. Another thing is that the thresholds that we use for treatment is really low. Um, so we don't use a really high threshold. We use a really low threshold. And like I mentioned before, we're using qPCR, so um, it's more sensitive. So we're able to pick up a lot of, um, we're able to pick up infection uh, quite quickly. And the fact that our threshold is very low, we don't get to um, severe or really high parasitemia. I think the most, the highest parasitemia we've seen um, was an individual who was febrile, and there were less than um, 10,000 parasites. So we haven't really seen um, really high parasitemia. In regards to the uh, publication, so we published our protocol um, paper and I can send our links um, to that. We also have the um, results of what I, I presented today uh, as a preprint. Um, it's under consideration uh, for um, review at a journal, but we make sure that all our papers are, um, are published either as preprints or in open access to enable um, a lot of people access the information. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, I, I'm going to, before I jump into the next question, which I'm going to direct to, to GetNet, um, uh, I'm just going to ask Gabe uh, if you wanted to set up um, the, the polls. Um, so for the various participants who uh, are listening on the call, there'll be a series of, of, of questions for, for the exit poll, which um, I'd encourage you to um, multitask and answer those, as well as listen to uh, some of the other um, uh, questions which we'll, we'll do over the, 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 the coming minutes. So, Getnet, um, for, for you, what I'd, what I'd like to um, uh, um, ask is, you know, what, what really must be done to raise the capacity of the African IRBs with regard to the conduct of human challenge studies? Yeah, thanks again, Greg, and uh, thanks for the question. It's a wonderful question. A couple of points that I want to make. The first one, in order to boost the capability of African IRBs, one, IRBs need to know where they are kind of do a self-assessment and it's not all IRBs that are lagging behind. There are wonderful IRBs, globally competent IRBs, which I, I suggest that IRBs, we need to start from knowing where we are and then following that, identifying a number of national and, and global resources. I want to recognize the work of EDCTP, Africa Academy of Science, AVARIF, a number of you know, WHO and NIH, a number of different initiatives that are out there building capability of African IRB. So trying to tap both national and international platform would be great. And the last piece, after building this short and long-term capability comes in, we have to be supported by availability of guidelines and policy. So capacity alone does work alone, and it has to be supported by the low guidelines and policies. There will be up to the standard, and that has to be done in an adaptive kind of manner whereby it has to be done regularly. I will stop there and happy and glad to see that question. Over. Thank you, Ketnet. Uh, so Andrew, I, I want to um, um, uh, ask, ask you a question now, which has come from, come from the participants. And that is, uh, 
you know, where does a human infection model uh, sit within a development plan from, from your perspective? And, uh, uh, and, and do you see potentially any benefits for accelerating uh, the evaluation of, uh, of, of a drug or a vaccine development plan um, and, and rationale for potentially including a human challenge model, um, either, uh, you know, now or, 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 or for next time? Really, really interested in your perspectives. But well, I think the, uh, the the challenge in getting uh, controlled human infection studies set up expeditiously in a pandemic um, is that uncertainty about safety that there is at the beginning when you don't um, have the information that you critically need um, about how you might approach um, challenging individuals. Of course, now we have a lot more information than we had six months ago or seven months ago about this virus and its propensity to cause disease and particularly the age structure of, of risk. So there's a lot more information known now than there was then. And of course, it makes it easier to think about how it might be done today than it, than it uh, was before. Um, but there's still, uh, in my mind, a major gap um, in being able to rapidly accelerate challenge studies and that is the rescue therapy. And that uh, despite um, claims around the world, I don't see anything at the moment which gives me confidence that I could stop someone ending up in ICU um, if I got the challenge dose wrong. And we don't really at this stage um, know what is a safe dose of virus to cause mild infection. And I, I, I think I, I feel particularly alarmed having seen younger adults um, who would be the, inevitably the people taking part in these studies, um, who work in settings where they're exposed to the virus, such as in healthcare, and um, who have become se uh, severely ill without any pre-existing risk factors. And that suggests to me that there, uh, that there is a particular um, challenge with, uh, with these studies in getting it right. And there's a responsibility to, um, uh, to, to try to accelerate the development, um, but also um, to, to make sure that we um, don't end up with challenge studies losing their currently good reputation as a way of accelerating development and, and be conducted safely. So I think there's some issues that we still haven't fully bottomed out um, around this. However, I, I do think with the huge advances that, that are being made in therapy, uh, the potential for new cocktails and monoclonals and so on, that we could reach a point very soon where these models could be used safely. So then the second question is, how should they be used? And I think for me, the answer here um, is, is rather um, covered in the previous talk, um, which, which is uh, that, uh, that there are going to be situations uh, where uh, with particularly vaccines that are deployed in trials at a stage when there's not very much disease, or perhaps when there are already some vaccines um, that um, have been deployed and it's harder to, uh, to move forwards um, with uh, new products. And I, I think it will be particularly important that we don't lose pace um, in development at that stage. We've got lots of exciting new technologies which are being developed um, and the, the, the risk that the development with those could be stalled if um, the rate of disease falls uh, with a low um, R0 as was just uh, described. And uh, so I think certainly in vaccine testing, comparing uh, vaccines against each other um, could be extremely useful, particularly in a setting uh, where uh, we don't have um, uh, an immunogenicity bridge, in other words, a correlative protection, which um, allows us to bridge between vaccines readily. And uh, the, in that setting, a challenge model could be extremely helpful um, in allowing that um, to happen. Um, so I think that to me, that's uh, at least for vaccines, that's where um, things land. But as you highlighted in your question, there's, there's lots of other uses for challenge studies, including understanding pre-existing immunity. Um, are you protected after you've had a, an infection um, and uh, testing drugs and so on? Great. Thank, thank you very much, Andrew. I, um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I, I, I do want to make sure that we get a, a question for, for everyone. So, so Marco, um, perhaps um, uh, uh, build, building upon uh, Andrew's, uh, Andrew's response there, I'd be very interested in, uh, in your perspective as a, as, as a, as a, as a regulator, um, 
the application of potential human challenge models for disease X, um, because I guess this is what we're, um, versus something which might be um, uh, more endemic within the environment, such as flu that we see more, more commonly. So um, interested if you had any regulatory perspectives um, um, you know, compare and contrast between you know, a disease X situation as, as COVID clearly has been um, versus something which we, we hope that you know, COVID doesn't stay, stay for a long, long time, but um, uh, something which is repeatedly within the, within the environment. So, so appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, of course, you know, it's very difficult to generalize uh, at least up to a certain extent and a lot of these uh, matters will end up to be, you know, uh, case specific. But I guess uh, the point is that uh, we should be open to consider human challenge models for those uh, circumstances in which conducting uh, a field efficacy trial is not feasible. Uh, and uh, we may think about, uh, you know, uh, sporadic outbreaks, uh, so pathogens uh, causing these sporadic outbreaks and uh, really um, kind of uh, ephemeral uh, uh, epidemics. And then uh, it, those circumstances are among those in which you may want to consider what else you can do in order to uh, demonstrate the protective level of uh, any specific vaccine. And, uh, and definitely those uh, could be those cases in which you might want to consider um, the, the role that could have a uh, human challenge models. Uh, I mentioned before Zika, which in my view remains uh, uh, an example of, of a case in which, you know, we are confronted with the difficulties of uh, uh, how can we gather good evidence with respect to the protective level of any vaccine. And, uh, and clearly, uh, you know, if we don't want to resort to the use of animal models uh, and to do uh, kind of immunobridging or animal rule, how you want to call it, in order to infer protection in humans, then the human challenge models could be an interesting way forward. The problem also that emerged uh, with Zika is that indeed, uh, even if rare, that could be some dark consequences, at least in certain individuals in terms of Guillain-Barré syndrome, uh, which makes very difficult from an ethic perspective to really give uh, a clear cut uh, green light. But, uh, but of course, you can think about how to mitigate this risk and how to make sure that at the end of the day, you could still be able to conduct uh, uh, such studies. Rescue therapy is of course another important element, uh, which uh, in many cases is, is really absent. And, and therefore it's important to take into account indeed the severity of the disease that uh, can be emerging, even if very rare, uh, uh, before allowing such studies to be conducted. But no doubt that uh, from a regulatory perspective, in many instances, such studies could be extremely informative. As, uh, and as said, even in the context of COVID-19, there might be circumstances, as has been highlighted before by, by the speakers, where indeed uh, you could think that they could provide you know, valuable evidence and information for vaccines that are not able to generate uh, um, field efficacy data or for which it might be difficult to extrapolate based on immunogenicity. Right. Well, th thank you very much, Marco. Um, well, uh, one, one final question to, to Zeb and, and then I'll hand over to, to, to Colin for closing. But uh, Zeb, a, a question has come up, you know, what, what's your own experience with community engagement uh, during the preparation of such studies, uh, uh, during study performance and, and thereafter? Thanks. Uh, I've mainly been involved with speaking with experts, so scientists and ethicists working on this, uh, but I'm aware there's been some fantastic work done by others on community engagement, uh, particularly in Kenya, uh, but also in Thailand, the UK and the US on challenge studies in general. Um, and there's been mainly engagement work on COVID challenge studies, as far as I know, been done in the UK and the US so far. Great. All right, well, look, th th thank you very much, Seb. Um, 
I, I, at, at this point, I'd, I would just like to, to, to thank very much the faculty for their, for their uh, expertise and, uh, and, uh, and for, for sharing your, your insights with, uh, with those on the seminar. Um, at this stage, I'd like to hand over to um, the co-organiser, Colin Pillai, to, um, uh, to describe the, the, the exit polling, if you will, and to close today's meeting. So over to you, Colin. So thanks, thanks very much. Um, th th thanks, Craig. Thanks, thanks a lot. And, and colleagues and uh, friends that are on the call, uh, again, sincere apologies that we're running a little bit late. Uh, first off, what I would like to say is that I would remind those that have joined this meeting that were also with us in the meeting in February uh, 2019 down in South Africa, where uh, some of the scientists that were in the room had heard, first heard about challenge studies for malaria. And I was personally surprised that there was so many individuals that were uh, vehemently against it. At that meeting, I promised and Bernd promised that we would come back and we would do a webinar on challenge studies. I'm glad that we could actually do it now within the context of COVID. Um, there are several colleagues that wanted to join this meeting, but due to time, time zone constraints, um, we, they, they would, were not able to join. And what I would like to assure you that the meeting has been recorded. Uh, Gabe, who in the background has been answering some of your questions, will place this recording uh, on the Pharmacometrics Africa website soon. Uh, we might also provide some mocked up questions because you've been really fantastic in terms of uh, providing questions. What I would also like to do is to add a reading list into, onto the website. Now, the faculty have uh, accumulated some papers that we think might be relevant on this topic, but we have uh, incredible support and, and expertise on the call today. So if anybody has got any suggestions for papers that are of relevance, uh, please pop it into the Q&A or the, the chat section now, uh, or send me an email after this call. For me, in, in, in terms of you know, closing and, and where I was personally on this whole topic, I think Zeb's idea that we look at the WHO principles, the eight principles, as you think about whether you support or not, and the principles that he outlined, scientific justification, uh, risk benefit assessment, consultation and engagement, coordination, site selection, participant selection, expert review and informed consent. And those would be key principles that you should consider as you go to decide whether you support these, these studies in, in the era of COVID or any of the other disease states that we uh, described. Here's what the results look like right now. And as you look at these results, these results are with regards to your views of whether you support the conduct of challenge studies. Um, these are anonymous, so we have not recorded who said what. Uh, I'm just looking at what the results were before. So for malaria, the, the pre-poll was 86%, that's increased to 93%. For dengue, it was 27, it's gone up to 43. For cholera, 30 to 67. For influenza, 46 to 57, and for SARS-CoV-2, from 44 to 52%. Uh, this, uh, with regards to SARS, this by and large reflects my own view. Uh, as we were planning this, this webinar, at one stage, Bernd asked me what my view was, and he was, uh, I was unfair rather, I asked him for a binary answer, yes or no, and he suggested that we look at this on a graded basis. So I've also gone beyond 50% in terms of my view. So in, in, in closing, what I would like to do is to really very warmly thank 
the A to Z of the team, you know, from Andrew to Zeb of the team. So Andrew, uh, Anri, who was in the background helping with uh, a lot of the logistics, Bernd, Claudia, Craig, Gabe, Getnet, Marco, Melissa, and Zeb. You've just been incredible as a panel. Uh, I'm especially sorry that, that Claudia Emerson could not be here, but really a big thanks to her for having brought many of the speakers into the loop. And big, big thanks to our uh, fantastic facilitator, Craig. So with that, I'd like to declare the meeting closed.